Let us have a word of prayer, and we will begin with this morning's message. Father, that is the marching to Zion experience. We are soldiers of the cross that are experiencing higher and higher experiences as we go round and round in the ladder of righteousness and holiness. Father, thank you for putting a children's story that focuses on the power of the gospel to transform us, to transform us from the inside out. Thank you for the Sabbath school that spoke about the importance of guarding our thoughts and our minds. Father, all of those have been preparing us for the message this morning, and I pray that through your Holy Spirit, I can do justice to all the thoughts and convictions you have brought to my heart. Grant me clarity of expression and grant us all clarity of hearing, not just with our ears, but primarily, Lord, to hear with a yielding, willing heart. In Jesus' name, amen, Lord. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. We've been discussing the armor of God, and this morning I'm going to kind of divert a little bit from the schedule and begin combining some of these because they're, as the more we talk about them, as I said before, the more difficult it is to separate what each are because the reality is, is the armor is singular, it's a unit. So this morning we're going to start with a quick review. We've established the battlefield. The battlefield is this world. The enemy that started the war in heaven has been cast down, and if the world hates us, it's normal. It hated Jesus. It has always hated Jesus. We saw how Cain hated Jesus. We saw how all the, the different uh, humans that lived uh, during the, the Antediluvians in Noah's day, they hated Jesus. The, the hatred towards Jesus did not start at the incarnation. It started the moment sin entered our experience. We talked about the sandals of the armor. And the sandals that Paul admonishes us to wear were worn first by Jesus. Jesus came to preach to our planet, his enemy territory, to the people that hated him. Jesus put on those sandals to come and preach to us the gospel of peace with God. And that gospel of peace with God is centered upon the truth about God, who God is. When Jesus came to teach us about his truth, it was the truth, not necessarily just of what we sometimes have fragmented them to be. The truth about the Sabbath, the truth about what happens when you die, the truth about the millennium. We will be discussing all of those things during the evangelistic series. We talk about them in different, different parts. The reality is that they are just one big whole. They are puzzles that reveal the heart of God. The, the, the animosity towards God, towards Jesus, is very much present today. I mean, you see how much effort we have to go to encourage everyone to hear about the Word of God. Billboards and radios and glow tracks and personal appeals and all these other things. The enemy of you and I, the enemy of God, does not want this truth about God to be known and understood. And it would be very shallow of us to think that he's busy keeping the community around us in this darkness. Surely they don't know about God. I was 28 years old, was already baptized when I first heard the truth about God. And I grew up in the home of a literature evangelist. So the question is, can we even grow up in the church and be ignorant about the truth about God? Yes, we can. There are people that come to our church from the outside, and whatever their background may be, sometimes they have that burden. If they, were, if they used to be involved in gangs, they, they want to reach out to gang members. If they used to be involved in substance abuse, they want to reach out to people that, that used that stuff before. My heart yearns for the young Adventist crowd because they remind me of me. Being here, not really wanting to be here, wondering what this thing is all about. We can be in the church and not know God. Je John chapter 3 tells us that there was a teacher of Israel who came to Jesus by night 
And he did not understand the basics of salvation. Jesus asked him, you are a teacher of Israel, and you do not know these things? We need to search our hearts. And this truth is not, the truth is absolute. But our understanding of it, as, as our brethren sang for us, every round of our understanding of God goes higher and higher and higher. Amen? We should not be where we, when we first met Jesus. When we first surrendered our lives to God, we should not be there again. It's been 10 years, 15 years. Have I been climbing those stairs? Soldier of the cross? Have I been climbing higher, higher? That is the call of the gospel. These are the things that keep many soldiers of the cross from growing. Keep our experience stagnant of this world. And we, we spoke, the last, not last Sabbath, but the Sabbath before, how in Acts 20, verse 7, when God says, you will not take my name in vain, that Hebrew word for vain is the same for idols. A false thing, a lie. God does not want to be related as if he was one of these idols. These idols enslave, as you can see in, in this illustration over here. I don't know if it's too clear for you, but he's holding something in his hand. Do you know what that is? It's not soy milk. It's what every Wednesday open our doors for our dear brothers and sisters who come to Alcoholics Anonymous. It baffles me. It baffles me how it is evident that that liquid destroys lives. And it baffles me that our government is totally legal. It's totally, you can buy as much as you want, no restrictions. Actually, I became frustrated with, with Costco because as you walk in, in the liquor section, you'll see a big sign that says, you need a membership to buy bananas and apples and oranges, but you do not need a Costco membership to buy liquor. We'll sell it to you whole, wholesale price. Take it home. We are in enemy territory. We are in enemy territory. And I've been skirting the issue. I've already laid out plans for a sermon series for next, uh, for next year, all the way up to February. And next year, we're going to talk a whole series, a whole month, on the, uh, on the matter of sexuality. But I, I feel convicted that I've been kind of skirting the issue, but this young man is not playing Sudoku in the computer. Maybe he's in Facebook. But I think the reality is that many Christians are there, men and women. This center picture here, in many ways, is a lot more dangerous than this one. You can't download that for free. During the Sabbath school, our elder John Tromley spoke about not conforming to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. This book called Desire of Ages speaks how sensuality can blunt our sensitivities for spiritual things. How immoral images can remove any desire for holiness. We talked about greed and extents. The point is this. Idols are false. They are a lie. They are a lie because, first of all, they cannot answer our deepest needs as humans. They are a lie because they distort the image of God, how we relate to God. And the third way that idols affect us tremendously is that the principle of the Bible, that by beholding we become changed. When I be behold what is false, when I worship what is a lie, by worshiping, by beholding, I become false. I become a divided human. And I'm speaking exclusively in the context of Christianity. While I am in church 
and the tie is on, I am a Christian. But the remaining part of the week, I am just like the idol, a false image, a lie. In my house, my children know I am not consistent with what I profess to believe. This armor of God and the issue of truth is a painful thing for humans to experience, and we will spend quite some time this morning looking at the story of Abraham. We're going to look at how Paul expounds on this, not just in, this, in these passages, but in other parts of the Bible. Um, warring thoughts. We talk about the battlefield. I apologize um, in the transition of transferring this, this presentation into the, this um, church's computer. The funds were changed, so I do apologize. But you have your Bibles. Amen? Do you have your Bibles? If you can't read it, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'll do the same. New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. This will begin to put the rubber to the road when we're discussing about the armor of God, the war, the battlefield, the enemy. Where is this war? We're going to allow Paul to clarify the Christian journey, the marching to Zion. What does that look like in real life? All of these allegories, all of these metaphors, what, what, what are they speaking of? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5 says the following. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not, what's that next war, word? War. Battle. Paul is speaking about battle here. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons, there's definitely a warfare here. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in who? In God. Verse 4. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Paul says quite a bit in these passages. I just wanted to highlight the fact that there is a war. Though he says we do not war according to the flesh. The the implication is clear. We do war. But we don't war with human reasons or human logics. Definitely not with human strength. We cannot wage this war the way we waged war against communism or other countries. We can't wage this kind of war, enter into this kind of war the way we do the drug, the war against drugs. Paul says we can't. Our weapons are different. The weapons of this warfare are intimately dependent on God. The power comes from Him. I want to spend some time speaking about these strongholds. Paul uses this imagery of, of the weapons that we have from God are to march against these strongholds, take these strongholds down, and have victory. Now, if you remember, I'm pretty sure you'll remember the story of Desmond Dawes. And if you know what escargot is, you'll never forget that story. You have to watch the sermon to understand what I've just said. Desmond Dawes was climbing up an escarpment. I will never forget that word either. He was climbing up this escarpment, and on the top there was this plateau, and there were situated strongholds. You've seen these. They're made up of sandbags, made like a a semi-igloo, and then they'll have like a little opening. And you know what's sticking out through that opening? A machine gun. A machine gun, which that, that was the challenge of, of the people trying to climb and, and take over this escarpment. They had set up several strongholds so that anyone that made it over that cliff, they would get mowed down. And Paul is using that imagery. We are in a war. 
And we have weapons for this warfare. And these weapons are mighty to take down those strongholds. Strongholds that if we do not come with the weapons of warfare, the correct weapons, we will get mowed down. What are these? Paul, what are these strongholds? We're talking about uh, il illustrative metaphors. Bring earth to us. The very next verse continues. If you still have your Bibles there, open it up again. He tells us there what these strongholds are. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. There are arguments, there are these logics that are taking place, and these reasoning, logics, these arguments are exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. And Paul closes that passage down, leaving no shadow of a doubt where the battlefield is. Because he finishes with bringing, I do apologize, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I mean, continue with the imagery of the stronghold. I'm getting shot at, I'm getting shot at, but I have the armor of God. Da, 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 da. Boom, 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 boom. It's over. We've taken captives, the people that were shooting at us. Who does Paul call the captives in that verse? Who is taken captive? I heard it. Taking captive every thought. That's where the arguments are taking place. That's where the reasoning and the logic against the knowledge of God takes place, in the thoughts. So let me tell you, where is the battlefield? In our minds. The greatest battle that rages daily is inside. Inside of us, our arguments, our logics, our reasonings that want to impede, that want to block, that want to prevent our growth in the knowledge. Is it making sense so far? The battlefield is our mind. That's why Paul says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles. Now, I, I, I remember that we don't say wiles when it comes to cartoons. We say wily. Who do you think of when I say wily? Yeah, Roadrunner. But that cartoon is a lie. Because that poor coyote, He's got to get that roadrunner one of those times, right? That anvil always falls on him. <laughs> that dynamite always explodes on wily coyote. But not with this one. This one is the wily lion who walks about roaring, seeking whom he may devour. He's devoured. He has a track record. Just like people that go hunting in, in Africa or used to go hunting and will come back with the head of an elephant or the head of a rhinoceros, this wily deceiver boasts certain things. He boasts that he took the wisest man on earth, the one whom God had bestowed divine wisdom, unbound. Who am I speaking about? He took Solomon and led Solomon to become the most debased king that brought apostasy for centuries into the kingdom of Israel. He led this man of God who, who we know that story about those two prostitutes that came with that one baby. And what did Solomon say to do to the living baby? But he didn't mean that. Why was Solomon trying to do that? So that the real mom would step forward. He has such a tender heart. 
He, he wanted this baby to go to the real mom. This very same king took his own children from his 700 wives and would burn them in the altar of fire. This wily individual has the, the story of David. David who could say to Saul, I'm not afraid of Goliath. God has saved me from the bear and God has saved me from the lion. Boom! But Bathsheba, and then Samson. Wiles. I looked it up in the dictionary. A friend of mine named David Ashrick would always encourage us to go to the dictionary and get um, definitions, because they do help in, in fleshing out some of these things. Um, and I hope I, 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 I do have it in my notes. Wiles. Words used with the intent of deceiving. Words. Words expressed with the intent of deceiving. This morning, Elder, Elder Trombley asked the question to the Sabbath school class. How do we get... Christ in us. You know, Christ in you, the hope of glory. How do you get Christ in you? Go to John chapter 14. Let's get it from the Bible. John chapter 14. It's not in the slide, so it's going to have to be living. Yes. John 15. Thank you, Lord. One chapter short. John chapter 15. Verse 5. Jesus is speaking about this in Christ idea, which John, Elder John Skrabowski has studied about this morning. God prepared all of our minds for this morning's message. John 15, 5 says... I am the vine, you are the branches. He who, and what is that next word? Abides in me. And I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. How does this abiding in take place? Verse 7. If you abide in me, and what? My words abide in you. How am I in Christ when his mind is in me? How does the mind of Christ become my mind when his words enter my thought process? Because our thoughts function on the basis of words. When we think, we think on words, with words. But the words we have, the words that we are born with, are so susceptible, so prone to the wiles of the enemy, to the idolatry, uh, the, the, the lies of the idols that Satan has prepared for us from the time we were, ch were children. We need a different kind of word. We need a divine word. A, div a word that transforms the way I think and protects that's why it's called the armor of God. The battlefield is our mind. Captive thoughts. Um, next Sabbath, we're going to kind of wrap everything up. And we're probably going to be looking at one Bible story and driving one point home. So this Sabbath, I'm going to try to wrap things up regarding the armor. About a belt, a breastplate, sandals, shield, helmet. So, but that's not, I mean, we get, we, we will miss out really on understanding what he's really speaking about because all of these have a counterpart, and the counterpart is the truth. The armor that guards my mind, the armor that guards the way I think, the way I relate to reality. 
When something happens to me, how do I interpret that? The armor of God is truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the word of God. These are the things that protect our soul from the enemy and his schemes, his lies, his wiles. I've shared with you how that one sermon that I spoke about entering into the Miami airport and Willie the skinny Cuban. You remember that story? I had a battle in my mind. Two conflicting belief systems. On the one side is my natural thought process. The way I naturally try to war with the world and the things that are in it. And this world view, this notion is that lies bring blessings. Lies protect. That, that was so convinced, Lord. I can't tell him the truth because something bad will happen. I have to tell him a lie so that something good can happen to me. And I have such a good lie, Lord. Just close your eyes, cover your ears, and let me say it. On the other side was the Spirit of God speaking his words to me. God was not saying, don't lie, don't lie. God was saying, you can trust me. I am real. That's why you don't take my name in vain. I am not like those idle lies that fail you when you need them most. I am the living God that in the moment of greatest distress, it's those moments that I long to show you what I can do. You know that I got through because I'm here today. After telling an immigration agent in the Miami airport that I left as an illegal immigrant, but the truth God could bless, not the lie. And though I told that immigration officer the truth, which should have put me on a plane back to South America, God honored my desire to wear his armor. Because really, the armor is God. This is not something separate, and this is something that I believe that we need to really grasp. The armor of God is not an armor that is not, it's not like saying the, the suit jacket of God. It's like, Lord, I need a suit jacket. Well, here I am. Wow, Lord, a nice suit jacket, and wow, it fits me, and I feel warm. Thank you. Bye. The armor is God. When you take off the armor, you're removing God from your life. God is the armor. We want to look, that from, look at that from the Bible. It's exciting. You may want to write these passages down. I'll say them out loud. You can go to our website and, and read the archives. And I, I probably just, again, I want to try to, try to make the fonts easier. God labels himself as the shield in Genesis 15.1. Reveals himself or describes himself as, as a sword in Deuteronomy 33.29. In Exodus 34.6, God defines himself as the truth, abounding in truth. In Jeremiah 23.6, God labels himself God our righteousness. He is our righteousness. In Exodus 15.2, he is our salvation. In Luke 14, he is the gospel of good news. God is the armor. You cannot separate the armor from God. Putting on the armor is something that I can put on and then walk into the world and pretend to live without God in my life, without God in my thought process, without considering what is God's will in my life, what does the Word of God say about the situations that I find myself in. And it's not just when I need a job or when my grandma gets sick. All my years, from the time I accepted God's call to, to be a, a minister for him through Bible working, through evangelism, and now as a pastor, 
and in my own personal journey growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist, I think I'm pretty safe in saying this. We live a compartmentalized spiritual life. Those cliches that we, that we say are true. The vast majority of our membership are only Adventist Christians during the seventh day. But come Saturday night, and so that you know that I'm not casting stones, I'm speaking from my own experience. When the conference would give us those little things that you would put on the fridge that tells you the minute, I wrote down that minute. Because every Sunday, I would go to this Vietnamese store around the corner from my house, and I was one of the first customers in there to buy the newspaper, the Sunday newspaper, for two major reasons. The comics and the free TV guide that came inside of it. What was happening in the world, who cares? I want to laugh with Garfield and memorize, memorize every program on HBO, on ESPN, on Fox. When are the Simpsons coming on? When is Married with Children coming on? It's old shows. Yearning men after God. <laughs> That killed me. I could not pretend to watch that filth and be a Christian. I thought you put on the armor when you go to church. And come sundown, see you next Sabbath. And then wonder, whenever we had a week of prayer, or whenever we had evangelistic series, or whenever we had a, a spicy speaker that stirred me, put a little fire under my, my heart, why it never stuck. I thought baptism was the way that would fix me, and so I got baptized twice. First time I was 11, I did it because I was too shy, and I didn't want to be the only one in the baptistry. Since all my friends were baptized, I kind of hid behind them. Mom and Dad, I'm baptized. Leave me alone. Okay, I did it. That was my thinking. Those were my arguments. I've done what I have to do. Let me get on with my life. But the second one was real. I wanted it. I wanted it. But I did not want the armor of truth. The truth about God. I wanted it part-time. It took 28 years, not because of boring sermons, so don't blame the pastor, not because of long sermons either, don't blame the pastor. My choice of lifestyle. I was careless about what went into my mind through the entertainment industry. We've already covered, so I'll just cap. The whole world is under the influence of the evil one. What people produce in music has words. Words become thoughts in our mind. And those thoughts lead us and can twist and affect how I believe and relate to God. Can they not? Any of those media channels, news included, a lot of what's called news is actually just sensationalized entertainment. That's all it is. If you want to get ratings. All of that garbage conforms us to the world leaves us vulnerable. 
as we try to come to those strongholds in our minds, those escarpments, we're trying to come up with our own armor, with our own strength, and get mowed down every time. And so why, why try to live this Christian life? Because it doesn't work for me. God is the armor, and He never fails. I want to spend some time as we close in Genesis chapter 15. So open your Bibles. This is going to be our closing passage. Genesis chapter 15. Once you've found Genesis chapter 15, put your finger there. And I want you to find Joshua chapter 24. look at Genesis 15, but before we engage Genesis, let's look at Joshua. Chapter 24. Let's put a little background to our well-known friend, Abraham. Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of who? Abraham. And the father of Nahor dwelt on the other side of the river in old times. And they, Terah and Nahor, they served other... What kind of a home did... Abraham grew up in idolatrous. He grew up in a home that was exposed to idols. Any home that allows idols inside their homes can expect a false spiritual experience. It's just a law of spirituality. By beholding, we become changed. Abraham grew up in the house where there were idols. And before we get to Genesis chapter 15, in Genesis chapter 12, God tells Abraham, get out of your country, get out of the land, get out of your country, and get out of your family's house, and get out of your father's house. You need to know that there's a better way than the way your parents lived. Many of us are just repeats of the spiritual experience of our parents, whether they were Adventists or not. But every generation gets called by God. Every generation gets called by God, get out of that repetitive, monotonous, hypocritical, false, shallow lifestyle that your parents practice. You're not destined, you're not stuck to live like that. You can have the real experience with the real God. Leave those idols alone. We don't have to use our parents as an excuse for what we do. That's something hap happens with generational Adventists. And it gets watered down and more watered down the more generations they are. When it should be the opposite. More committed, more surrender, more com involved in the mission of the church. You don't have to do what your parents did. God is calling you for something higher. An experience with the real God. Are you gutsy enough to chuck the idols that you may have grown up with? That your parents may have had, even as Christians, even as Adventists? Are you willing to put on the armor of God? and experience the reality that Abraham, ha Abraham was called to experience? God did not want to leave Abraham stuck where he was. Because we read, right, how Abraham said, my sister. Isaac lied and said, my sister. Jacob lied and said, I'm Esau. His brothers lied and said, a beast killed your son. Lies, falsehood, falsehood. He was from these idols. Abraham 
up like that. It was part of his worldview. It was the arguments in his mind. How he would relate to reality, how he would relate to God. God called him out. And through his experience and through his journey, Abraham learned. Abraham learned the beauty of trusting God and demonstrating that trust through surrendered obedience. Am I willing to cut? We're preparing for an evangelistic series. Am I willing to cut? Am I willing to cut free from those idols? From the things that kept my dad, my mom, maybe me. Maybe you are a father, a mother that recognizes you want to leave a solid legacy for your children, a solid spiritual legacy, a legacy that will be for them a foundation, a solid foundation that they can build their faith upon. Abraham experienced what God told him in Genesis chapter 15. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. I am your shield. You can trust my word. Allow my word to affect the way you think and relate to me. It will change your life. Lord, time escapes us this morning. Search our hearts, Lord. What do we have in our homes? What do we have in our homes? that feed and nurture the lies about you? Is it media, Lord? Secret habits? Open habits? Is it compromise for the sake of peace? Speak to our hearts, Lord. Convict us of the fact that as you were a shield to Abraham, you will be a shield to us even now as we learn to trust you and obey you, to take a stand in the armor of God. Father, I pray for all the families here present. I pray for the mothers and the fathers. I pray for the grandparents. Father, I pray for the children and the grandchildren. The story of Abraham, Lord, is a story about grandparents and parents and children and grandchildren and how you patiently but powerfully worked to set them free from the lies of idols. That is, that, that is my prayer for my home. That is my prayer for every home here this morning. Set us free, Lord, from the lies of the idols. Allow us to know the only true God through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen, Lord.